Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We're dealing with Matthew chapter 24, the true prophecies that Jesus gave us. Think about that, the contrast. And we're going to contrast some things today between being drunk, being sober. And it all depends on what one of two types of people you are. There are only two types of people in the world. Those who believe the Bible and those who don't give a care. They don't believe it. They even go to church and they don't believe it. Or they override it somehow. Their prophet speaks and what he says is more important than what the Bible says. But anyway, the contrast of Jesus giving us a prophecy. And it's not like Nostradamus prophecy. Have you ever read Nostradamus? Okay. Don't waste your time. Okay. Cause I've read it and makes absolutely no sense at all. Really? Some guy named Hister is supposed to be Hitler. Come on. I don't buy it for a second. I don't think he got anything right. In fact, we know from Deuteronomy 18 that all Nostradamus has to be is wrong one time. We don't believe a word he says. Okay, so he's an example of a false prophet. And if you've ever read Nostradamus's quatrains, and then you read something like Matthew 24, you see a clear difference. Jesus is not veiling his language in any way, shape, or form. Nostradamus is, takes somebody else. In fact, there's, I don't know how many books there have been written trying to explain Nostradamus's quatrains, his prophecies, okay? and all enigmatic, written in some sort of symbolic language, which some say, that's how the book of Revelation is written. I would agree with that, that there are symbols in the book of Revelation, but they are realities. The beast actually does have seven heads and ten horns. That's what John saw. He saw these locusts coming up out of the bottomless pit, and no, they were not Black Hawk helicopters, okay, or anything like that. They were these locusts with scorpion tails, with the faces of men and the hair of women. We won't get into all that. But anyway, we're dealing with contrast today in Matthew chapter 24. Here's what Jesus said. Matthew 24, verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So last week, we started on looking at the spirit behind these false prophets. It's a spirit of, it's a spirit that's going to bring at some point a strong delusion and a lie is going to be told. Now, there are multitudes of false prophets. Think of, um, you've got all of the the so-called Latter-day Prophets, people that have actually started religions like Joseph Smith, Ellen White, people like that. Um, a lot of the charismatic Latter-day Prophets, every one of them is a false prophet. Yeah, every single one of them is a false prophet. How do I know that? Because the Bible plainly tells us, book of Revelation, after Revelation 22, Nobody's adding words to the prophecies of this book. So anybody, I don't care who it is, anybody coming along saying, I've got a prophecy from God and it's not in the Bible, I don't believe it. You don't have to believe it either. But we have all of them. We have, um, we have all of the false prophets of the Roman Catholic Church, those who are teaching false doctrine. Uh, we have some of the New Age false prophets. You have Helena Blavatsky, you have Elise Bailey, you have um, a lot of the New Age writers, you have the UFO people, people like Stephen Greer and Tom DeLonge, foretelling a time when the aliens, the gods, are going to come down and bring us into a new age, because it rhymes with sewage, a new age of peace and enlightenment, harmony, and we're going to travel the stars and we're going to be like gods once we allow them to mingle themselves in with our DNA, of course that's coming, we know that's the fourth kingdom, 
Then you have the scientific false prophets who might be telling, well, you know, the earth is going to end in a billion years from now. The sun's going to get bigger. Things like that. We have all of those. I don't have time to deal with every single type of false prophet. But we know that all of them are heading us to one particular course. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11. The day when God shall send a strong delusion and everybody in this world is going to believe a lie. Why? Because they didn't want to believe the truth of the Word of God. Remember, two types of people. Those who believe the Bible and those who don't want to believe the Bible, no matter what, even those who are in some form of Christian religion. So, we started on last week looking at the spirit behind some of these false prophets. Think of altered states of consciousness. Now, you can either do that, and there, there's actually, there's like a, a war going on. Those who are outside of the scriptures who are trying to achieve this sensation of bliss and harmony, being at one with the universe and all of this stuff. Um, there's actually sort of a battle going on between which way is the best. Those who live sort of a, a true new age life, they're into eating grass and roots and herbs and things like that. And they believe in having a healthy lifestyle, a healthy body, nothing wrong with that. But then they say, we don't use artificial means in order to bring ourselves into harmony and transcendence. When they go into their yoga pose and they do their mudras with their, you know what the word mudra? Yeah, it's the little things that people who do yoga do with their fingers, okay? I always thought they were like picking a booger off their finger or something like that. But anyway, those are called mudras. And different hand gestures determine how your chakra is opened or how your prana or your kundalini rises up, whatever. The word mudra means mark. You know that little dot that Hindus put on their forehead? That's called a bindi. You know what that means? A spot. Remember what the Bible says about us, that we're to keep ourselves unspotted from this world. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, right? But anyway, the New Agers, they say the best way to achieve this blanked out mind where you put yourself in an altered state of consciousness, best way to do it is through meditation. And that takes years of practice and training. And then you've got the other people, like you know, a lot of people in Hollywood and California, they're going, ah, forget that, I'm going to get high. So they take drugs and do it. It's a lot quicker. Okay, and they go a lot deeper, probably, but they're all achieving the same thing. They're emptying and blanking out the mind, completely void of any thought whatsoever. And what that does, it removes a firewall, I call it. A wall of separation. Uh, a door. Aldous Huxley talked about this door of separation in our mind that kept us from achieving these higher transcendent thoughts. So of course, Huxley and others experimented with LSD. Francis Crick, one of the co-founders of DNA, used LSD to visualize the two entwined serpents of DNA. So they say that you use LSD or some other thing to open up that wall, to let thoughts come in and visualizations that man could never achieve on his own. Sounds like a doorway to hell is what it sounds like. It sounds like a gateway to the bottomless pit, letting things in. See, God built that wall in there for a reason. He calls it in the Bible, sobriety, being sober, girding up the loins of our mind. Okay, think about that, okay? We gird up our loins, so we can go about our work, right? Well, the Bible uses that in the context of girding up the loins of our mind. In other words, being sober. Having all the right doors shut so that things that shouldn't come in don't come in. So here's what I think is going to happen. I think 
literally, there's going to be a falling away. And I don't mean just a philosophic, metaphorical, everybody's going to abandon what's in the Bible. I think literally, just as the stars of heaven are going to fall, I think everybody on the earth is going to fall backward. Think about in the Masonic rituals, Hiram Abiff, where a person is hit on the forehead, they fall backward. Then, with the strong grip of the lion's paw, I actually saw two masons shake hands like that one time, gripped each other on the arm. The strong grip of the lion's paw, Hiram Abiff is raised back to life again after three days. Think about that. Oh, you're probably thinking of what goes on in the Pentecostal charismatic churches, right? Called slain, murdered, in your spirit, where they touch you on the forehead and you fall backward and you lose consciousness. And when you rise up, now you have this inner knowledge that no one else can give you. It's the same as in Kundalini, where you have a guru who has the spirit of Shakti, S H. A-K-T-I. You know who that is? It's Mystery Babylon. It's a her. It's a she. It's a she-devil. It's what it is. He has the spirit of Shakti, and if you want to achieve that illumination, he touches you on the bindi, on the dot, the spot, on your forehead, and you pass out, and now you have this enlightenment after you fall backwards. So I do think there's coming a day when everybody is going to be laid out taken over by a drunken, evil spirit. So last week, we were tying these things together. We just got started talking about drunkenness, not just in the physical sense, but in the spiritual sense. When you are spiritually drunk, wine and strong drink, which bring those about, are indicative of false doctrine in the Bible. Let's go to Isaiah 28. This is where we... We're focusing on last week, woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower. And then in verse 7, they have also erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. Notice the language here. The priest and the prophet, he's dealing with the religious people, have erred through strong drink. Notice the error. It's an error in doctrine. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way. Think of Christ being the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Remember, people who say, I don't see anything wrong with these two men getting married in our church. And I've had, I've had preacher friends that I know who have preached in various churches, preached against sodomy. And the church members chewing them out for that. Do you know why? Because they had family members that were sodomites. And how dare somebody come in and tell them that their lifestyle is wrong? You see, they're not thinking of the way, the truth, and the life. They're not thinking Bible. They have a drunken spirit, and it causes them to stumble in judgment air in vision, just like drunk people do. And then it says, for all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. And then, of course, God contrasting that with, whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Where he says, line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, here, here little and there little. And drunks can't do that. Drunks can't add two plus two. That's why cops give them a a sobriety test? Tell me the alphabet starting with the letter L without singing it. They can't do it. S count backwards starting from the number 97. And they can't do it. They can't add this to that. It's that it, because of the wine and the strong drink. It's the same way when it comes to doctrine, when it comes to understanding, when it comes to knowing God. And what you're going to see today is that God clearly calls us not to drunkenness, not what Rodney, and I've been watching Rodney Howard Brown videos all week. This guy's, I'm going to show you something. This guy, this guy is a reprobate, false prophet, 
claiming that everybody must be drunk in the spirit and that it's a new move of God. And how dare anybody question it? Well, I am questioning it. We're supposed to. We're supposed to prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. We're supposed to be Bereans and actually read and search the scriptures to see whether these things be true. Not even the apostles had a problem with that because the Bereans wanted to know whether or not they were being lied to or not. So, Leviticus chapter 10, verse 8, one of the first places God warns us against wine and strong drink. Notice again the language. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, and that ye may put difference Notice the language between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean and that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. Deuteronomy 29, 6. Ye have not eaten bread, neither have you drunk wine or strong drink. Notice the language that you might know that I am the Lord your God. So think about what he's saying here. If you're drinking... Sometimes people that drink don't even know who their wife is. The story that, and the guy got away with it. I was stunned. Man visiting St. Louis, downtown hotel, nice hotel, gets drunk, is on a business trip, goes to what he thinks is his room, crawls in his bed. There's a 13-year-old girl laying in his bed. So he rapes her. Then he finds out it's not his room. He was so drunk, he went into the wrong room. I don't know how that happened, but that's what he did. And he got off. Found him not guilty. It's crazy. But that man destroyed not only his life, but another person's life as well, and their family. He destroyed that by what he did because he was drunk. He couldn't tell the difference. Things that he normally wouldn't do, he does. Some people say, well, that was the wine talking. Believe it or not, that's some of the things you hear in some of these drunk churches. Oh, that's just the wine talking. Oh, excuse me, I've been drinking the Holy Ghost. And they boast it and they laugh hysterically about it. The laughing revival, drunk in the spirit, all of these things like this. And God's telling us, if you see that going on, those people don't know who God is. And isn't that Isaiah? These people claim that they have the Holy Spirit now, right? Oh, we're, that we're so full of the Spirit, we can't even stand up straight. And yet, the seven spirits of God given to us in Isaiah 11, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Spirit of the Lord means Jesus is his Lord. The Spirit of wisdom, Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of might, the Spirit of knowledge and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And these people, A, don't know who God is, B, and they don't fear him anymore. They're not afraid to wander off into these false doctrines and these altered states of consciousness. They don't fear God. They don't care. They don't care what the Bible says, and they always mock us. Well, you religious people with your traditions. Excuse me. Paul told Timothy not to go away from the traditions that he had been taught, especially those from the Apostle Paul. The, the tradition that we have is not some made-up thing like we do every Christmas and Thanksgiving. It is what we have learned over the last 2,000 years from the Word of God. And these people would have you all believe that everybody got it wrong until the Azusa Street Revival, whenever that was, early 1900s. When the Holy Ghost really poured out, people were drunk all over the place, and now we're having this new wave of drunkenness everywhere. The new apostolic reformation, the manifest sons of God, Joel's army crowd. And some of these guys are actually real drunks. Oral Roberts' uh, son, Richard Roberts, took over daddy's multi-million dollar ministry, right? Okay? He's at a one of these laughing revival things, Rodney Howard Brown, he's wallowing all over the floor, acting drunk. Now, some of this stuff is fake. But there's a guy, and I'll show you a clip of this. 
that he is absolutely, he becomes still while he's speaking, and he remains in a locked position for 10 to 15 minutes. Rodney Howard Brown then takes over and starts speaking for him because eventually he just fell backward. They caught him, laid him down, but he remained locked in a position for quite a lot longer than your muscles would allow you to. I think it's very possible this man was under the influence of a spirit, but it was not the Holy Spirit. It was not the Holy Spirit. So God is saying, if you get drunk, you drink wine, a strong drink, you won't understand doctrine. You won't see what's in the Bible. You won't know the difference between holy and unholy. A spirit will come on you and you won't know that it's an unclean spirit. You won't know and it'll make you feel so good. Why do people drink? Why do people get high? It feels good, doesn't it? It appeals to the satisfying of the lust of the flesh. And that's why people do it or else people wouldn't do it. And again, you ask, well, why did God put marijuana on this earth anyway if it wasn't for us to enjoy? Yeah, well, why did God create yeast, leaven? And why did God create leaven to eat the sugar out of barley or hops or wheat or grapes or potatoes or rice or whatever? Cactus, eat the sugar out of it, release alcohol and become an alcoholic drink. Why did God allow that? Again, it's to give man a choice. Those of you who have drank or taken drugs before, you know the feeling, you know what it feels like, but then you know the disaster that occurs. There is no such thing as a good drug that has no down side effects, no bad side effects. All of them do. And once you get high, either through liquor or drugs, you want to stay that way and it never happens, never works. And I have a suspicion that the devil's crowd is going to sell this world on a high that they can receive where they will n never come down. Think about all the states now legalizing marijuana all across this country. I watch old TV shows. Dragnet's one of my favorite. 1968, you have the pot generation telling Jack Webb, you know, Sergeant Friday on Dragnet, telling him, it won't be long before marijuana be legal in the States. Yeah, it's taken a while. Why do they start out with medical marijuana first? To get everybody getting high with an excuse. Then it will turn to recreational marijuana, just like alcohol. All of it, all of it represents a drunken state and you don't know the difference between clean and unclean, between holy and unholy. And when you're high, you don't care. First Thessalonians. Now, we're going to contrast. Gonna, I'm not done dealing with the drunk spirit yet, but we're going to contrast. I'm going to show you why I say what I say, why I believe what I believe. Because I had somebody offer me, Stan Johnson, the Prophecy Club, offered to get me drunk in the spirit, offered to impart that to me by laying on the hands. And I refused. And I remember having a meeting with him in his office in Topeka, Kansas. And we were talking about this. And I'm not kidding you. I've never felt this before. There was a wall between us in, in that room, a very powerful, it wasn't visible, but I'm telling you, there was a presence in that room that was keeping me away from him. And I, I weep sometimes when I think about how God could have, should have turned me over to a reprobate mind, but he didn't. He kept me. He kept me sober. So this is what actually the Bible, the Holy Spirit, tells us to do. First Thessalonians chapter 5. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Think about bars, taverns. 
You've never been in a very well-lit tavern, have you? No, unless it was a church. Why are all the churches turning all the lights off? Because people love darkness, and it's not just metaphorical darkness. It's physical darkness. Drunks don't like the lights on. Stoned people. They get stoned at night. Not always, I know. But they love darkness, both physically and spiritually. We are not in darkness. That day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light. Think of the gospel, the light of God's word, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Study sleep. Sleep is an altered state of consciousness. Now, it is natural, brought about by the pineal gland in the middle of our brain. Yes, it is kind of like a third eye because it senses light. And when the lights go out at night, the pineal gland starts releasing melatonin. And we go... Oh, I'm sleepy. How many of you yawned just now? Okay. So anyway, we get sleepy and we sleep during the night. And then when the sun comes up, our eyelids are thin. The light goes through our eyelids into our pineal gland. Our pineal gland stops releasing melatonin and we start waking up. It's a natural process. But during that time, do we think? No. Do we hear? Not really. Do we see? No. Should we make rational decisions? No. Should we sign contracts? No. We can't do anything like that. And he's telling us, now he's not saying don't ever sleep. Don't go to sleep at night, nothing. He's telling us don't sleep spiritually. Don't get drunk. Don't be slain, murdered in your spirit. None of that. Let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and what? Be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, if you believe this Bible, get out on your face before God and tell God thank you for what he's done and what he's given to you. And the fact that he could have, like me, he could have turned you over to a reprobate. Some of you have come out of this madness. You've come out of the New Age. You've come out of Roman Catholicism. You've come out of the occult. You've come out of the charismatic Pentecostal madness, nonsense, drunkenness. You've come out of that. People have told me about how Benny Hinn waved his hand in front of them. They felt electricity. They were slain in the spirit. I get, and they asked me, they, they were scared. They said, can we be saved? I said, yeah. God can change anybody. God can raise anybody from the dead. Amen? But be thankful that God has not turned you over. He said, they that be drunken are drunken in the night. And I believe the night is coming. I believe a darkness. See, the day of the Lord is a day of clouds and thick darkness. And God said, like Genesis 9, when I bring a cloud over the land, what does the cloud do? Bring darkness. And I think a darkness is coming over this earth. And when that darkness hits, God is going to slay every man, woman, and child on this earth who are not born again. He's going to cause them to literally, I believe, literally fall with a drunken spirit, and they will believe the strong delusion that's coming. He said in verse 6, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Now take a look at this. What is that? That's a drunk security guard. You know, a hundred years ago, if this guy was in any military, he would be shot for going to sleep. What does God say about the watchmen nowadays? They're dogs that don't bark. And they're all drunkards. Every one of them loves to sleep. And if you've got a guy, a pastor, a prophet, a priest, 
anybody religious, your, your own family, your own father, if you have people supposed to be watching out for you, and yet they're drunk, either physically, spiritually, or both, I didn't finish telling you about Richard Roberts. It just hit me. The guy laid out on the floor acting like a drunk. Well, guess what happened? He got pulled over outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma a few years ago. Field sobriety test. He was drunk as a dog. He was drunk, physically drunk. They just seemed to go together. I've known pastors who were bad alcoholics. Tried to keep it hid, but you just can't keep it hid from everybody all the time, can you? So you have pastors that are drunkards, watchmen, people that are supposed to be watching for your souls, people who are supposed to be on guard, warning you when the sword is coming. And yet they get drunk with alcohol, drugs, pornography, you name it. There's a whole list of things out there that Mystery Babylon loves to get pastors and men of God tied up with. And it causes them to be drunk spiritually. And they don't, they, they stop putting a difference between holy and unholy. You know, my mom used to tell me when I was young, and I'd go to church, I'd sit at the piano, and I would play some of these ragtime songs I learned how to play years ago. And she'd say, don't play that in church. And I'm going, well, I play them at home. Yeah, this is the house of God. I didn't understand. I was learning to play the piano, and sometimes playing that stuff at home is okay, but mom knew the house of God was different. They're just things that we don't do in the house of God. We don't smoke cigarettes in the house of God, do we? We don't bring our beer to the house of God, do we? We don't sit with paper plates eating baked beans and turkey during church service, do we? They're just things we don't do because that house was set aside for the worship of Jesus Christ. And I was taught to put difference between sacred and profane between holy and unholy, between clean and unclean. And a watchman, somebody who's supposed to be watching out for people's souls or people's lives, policemen, soldiers, whoever, politicians, who are so drunk, they cannot stay awake. Paul says, let us watch and be sober. And you can't watch, you can't be a watchman if you're spiritually or physically drunk. Just can't happen. The enemy's coming in, and you never know what hits you. First Timothy, here's qualifications for a bishop and his wife. Two places in the Bible gives us the qualifications. Paul does this, tells us, number one, he is to be a man because only a man can be the husband of one wife. And by the way, every Catholic priest is out of order because they don't allow him to have wives. There's a reason we're to be the husband of one wife, and that's to keep us straight. You know what I'm saying? Keep us right. But here's another qualification of a bishop. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. A lot of things here. But the two words that I see going together are vigilant and sober. Because if you're drunk, you're not vigilant. You know what a vigil is, don't you? It's a watch. You're watching. When you're a soldier and you're creeping into enemy territory, should you be drunk, high? If you are, you're dead. The enemy's going to cut you down. Vigilant means always alert, always awake, 
ready to fight. Sober needs no definition. It is the opposite of being drunk. He's not to be given to much wine. Now, again, Paul did give us limited places where wine could be used for medicinal purposes. That's why he said not given to much wine. But some people shouldn't even touch it at all. Some people I know who are true alcoholics, they can't even take cold medicine with alcohol in it. Can't eat meals cooked in wine or any, any you know, bourbon chicken or anything like that. They can't do it because it throws them into that craving for alcohol and they can't touch it. And I salute guys like in our church like Roy and others who strive every single day, whether it's against alcohol, drugs, pornography, you name it. Because Mystery Babylon makes men drunk in various ways, but who strive against that daily, endeavoring to remain sober. Same thing is said about a bishop's wife. Even so, must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. And I've known many preachers whose ministries have been absolutely destroyed by their wife's behavior. So God bless all you pastor's wives out there too, who are endeavoring to follow the scriptures, being qualified, and thus qualifying your husband to be the man of God that he is. Titus chapter 2. In Titus, we have Paul's giving a list to the church people of things that they should be doing. As a church family, and churches are families, sometimes big families, sometimes small families, but they're families. And there's things that they're supposed to do. We have aged men in our church. We have aged women in our church. We had two dear saints. They've now gone on to be with the Lord. I've known them since I was a child, and I knew I could always count on them for sober thinking. They helped guide a young man, me, out of some very terrible things that I was going to bring into the church, like rock and roll music. They prayed for me, and at times I would go to them for their counsel. And as I told Brother Jim Waymeyer, my good friend, whose mother was a charter member of our church, and I'd known her all my life. I said, I decided one day, Brother Jim, not to be an embarrassment to your mother, but to be a blessing to your mother. I said that to him on the day of her funeral. And he said, Mike, thank you for that. And I don't regret it. So there's a whole list of things that the Apostle Paul is telling us as church members to watch out for one another and to teach one another. He says, Titus chapter 2, verse 2, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate. That means they're not brawlers. They don't jump at a fight all the time. Sound in faith, in charity, in patience. And we're to pass that on to the younger generation. Verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Titus chapter 2, verse 6, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. So the example, can you imagine? Here I am, a, a young pastor, and I went to a, a Christian school when I was in grade school. And I had a yearbook, and I looked at the board members in that yearbook, and I knew them by name, had seen them in that church. So I'm out on visitation one night, and I stop at a gas station to get a soda pop, and there's one of those men in front of me in line, buying his wine coolers. He didn't know me, but I knew him. And I saw the corruption that creeps into men as time goes on. Man, those things, we have to fight them off. Everything. We have to fight them off because we don't understand the damage 
that we can do to young men and young ladies whose lives we affect by going astray from these words, being sober, temperate, not a brawler, men of faith, men of charity, men of patience, women of sobriety, teaching younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to love Jesus Christ, teaching the younger generation to be sober-minded. Why? Well, there's a reason why. And he says it in the same chapter, Titus chapter, chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, well, there's a whole list of things that we have to learn to deny. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Why? Because we're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We used to say, yeah, I'd hate to be in a bar on the day of the rapture. Well, how true is that? I would hate to be caught doing anything in the day when the Lord appears in the air. We're to be looking for that day. And those who are drunk, they don't look for anything. They can't. They can't see. So, if you're drunk spiritually, high spiritually, altered state of consciousness, devils crawling in and out of your brain, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then you're going to fall. Fall for the man of sin. Fall for the strong delusion. Fall away. First Peter chapter 1. Understand how important it is that we be sober. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. That explains what it means to gird up the loins of your mind. It means be sober. And hope, how far? To the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And again, if you're drunk, he will not be revealed to you. You know who will be revealed to you? Then shall that man of sin, the son of perdition, be revealed. And that's who you will believe is Jesus Christ. You're going to miss it. I'm telling you, you're going to miss it. And you're going to fall. Then he says, 1 Peter 4, 7, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Then, one of the most important places in the whole Bible, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be sober, be vigilant. There he says it again. What are the qualifications for a bishop again? He's to be vigilant and sober. That's coming from Paul. Now we have a double witness coming from Peter. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Isn't it interesting? that God, not evolution, made lions the same color as that tall grass that they hide in. Not, it's not like they're black lions or orange lions in, you know, yellow stalks of grass. They're all the same color, meaning they blend in well, they hide well. Lions tread softly and you would never know they were there until it's too late. So, here's what I'm asking you to do. Get out your King James Bible, go through the whole thing if you have to, and find the verse in there where it says, be drunk. Find the place in there where it says that God's Spirit is a drunken spirit, causing us to fall, causing us to have altered states of consciousness. Find that for me in the Word of God, will you? And I'll show you again all of these places where it tells us, be sober, be sober, be sober, be sober, be sober. Our adversary, the devil, wants us drunk. Why? So we can't see him coming. Walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. 
knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. This is universal. Every one of us are required to be sober. So because we have an adversary out there that was designed to do one thing and do it well, and that is destroy men's souls. God designed the devil that. Now think about this. We have in Revelation, and this to me is a, is a great illustration. We have in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, One of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Now think about this. We have the lion of the tribe of Judah, and we have the devil, a roaring lion. Well, to me, all lions look alike, okay? How will we know which one's Jesus, which one's the devil? How will we know? Well, if we're sober, we'll know. If we're drunk, that's what he's saying. Be sober. Be vigilant. And think about Isaiah 14, where Lucifer says, I will be like the Most High. Hosea 13, where God says, I will be unto them as a lion, a leopard, a bear, a terrible beast. People are going to believe that the devil is God, the Antichrist is Christ. They're going to believe that, and it's a lie. And because of that drunk spirit, the false doctrine, the altered states of consciousness, fulfilling and gratifying the lust of the flesh, people won't know the difference. They won't be able to tell. So you can either listen to all the people out there telling you to be drunk, or you can listen to the Word of God telling you, warning you, as we see the day of Jesus Christ approaching, be sober. Now, back to being drunk. Jeremiah 51, verse 7. Babylon hath built a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore, the nations are mad. Jeremiah 25, 16. And they shall drink and be moved and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Remember, the word mad doesn't mean, I'm mad. It means you're out of your mind, crazy-headed, drunk, in a stupor, out of, your, out of your brain, out of control, chaos, disorder. Now, this is hard for some people to take. But I'm going to show you some clips that I've gathered together of what I'm talking about. You're actually going to see people in a drunken stupor in what's supposed to be the house of God. And you're actually going to hear somebody say, God is a God of chaos. Is that what the Bible says? No. Bible says, let all things be done decently and in order. So if you walked into church, you sat down, the service starts, and all of a sudden your pastor is laying on top of another man in the, in the church service. Is that decent? Is that in order? No. So I know some people don't like to see this, but I'm going to show you what really happens when a drunken spirit enters into the church. Take a look. The lady from Brent Baptist, come on up here, honey. Ah, oh, come on, come on. Come on up. She's still, 
She's still drunk under the power. She can't hardly make it. That's what that's all about. Hi. Amen. You got something last night, didn't you? Just stand up here and lean up against that wall right there. It's Brentwood, not, not East Brentwood. Oh, Brentwood? Brentwood? Assembly of God. Assembly of God. So, Lord touched you last night. I stand here and hold him. Uh, what's your name? Where are you from? My name is Sandy Fields, and I'm a pastor's wife, and I'm from, um, I'm from, um, I know the feeling. <laughs> That's Stevie, and I'm Johnny. <laughs> and anyway, when she starts uh, singing, you know, uh, what's that song? When she sang, uh, you know, come running, come running, come running to the mercy seat. And, you know, my whole life, my whole Christian walk, all I wanted to do was to intercede for y'all. You know, just be that intercessor that God wants for the hurting, for the church, you know. And, and being hurt myself, it's like I couldn't do that to the full capacity. But last night when, when Chastity um, sang, you know, come running to the mercy... There is a, and this is not, we don't parade this kind of stuff. This is not, this is not us. We ask people to come and testify, but I want to tell you, God is moving in the land. He's moving in the land. And what we need in our church is this godly disorder. That's what we need. Godly disorder. Let that joy begin to bubble right out of your belly. Let that joy begin to bubble. Let that joy begin to bubble. Let that joy begin to bubble right out of your belly. Let that joy begin to bubble right out of your belly. Let that joy begin to bubble right out of your belly. Get them all drunk, Jesus. Get them all filled. Get them all filled, Lord. Get them all filled. 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 Now go ahead and have another drink. I said go ahead and have another drink. 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 Phil, 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 
Phil, Phil with a new one. Phil, Phil, Phil with a new one. Phil, 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 Phil with a new one. Phil, 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 Phil with a new one. See and hear. They heard them speaking in tongue, but what did they see? For them to think they was drunk, they must have thought they was drunk. They were acting like drunks. Drunk again! Drunk again! We got there. Oh! <laughs> 
Be blessed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm gonna do it here. <clears throat> well,
I don't know about you, but you can actually see, you can actually feel the satanic, unclean, foul spirits in those videos. You know that that's not the Holy Ghost. Nothing like the Holy Ghost. God is a God of order. All you have to do is look at the universe, this world, the structure of this world, the creation, this Bible, to see that God is a God of order, not chaos. Remember what the motto of the New World Order is, ordo ab chao, order out of chaos, or actually the Greek word chaos means the abyss, the pit. That stuff comes right out of hell. Yeah, it's a church. Jesus is supposed to be there, and they talk about Jesus, they talk about the Holy Spirit, they talk about God. They might mention a few things out of the Bible. But God's not there. Same with, it doesn't have to be all that charismatic madness. Just the straight out false doctrine and refusal to teach the Word of God and the Word of God's principles in a church service qualifies as having a drunk spirit. Because if you've noticed, all the churches where they have the drums and the lights and the fog machines and the professionally hired praise band. Oh, you didn't know those people weren't saved, did you? You didn't know that? Most of these churches that they have the, the budget for it, they don't look for volunteers in their service to lead the worship. They hire them. Professional rock bands. One pastor telling me, Mike, I don't even know the names. He wasn't a pastor of the particular church he was going to. But he was on staff and he said, I don't even know who these people are. Something wrong with that. So just because the church is not doing all these things that we just saw in the video, they can still have a drunken spirit because of the false doctrine and the refusal to follow with the word of God. Remember, the evidence of a drunk spirit is they don't know the difference between clean and unclean, between holy and unholy. And if you've noticed, the churches with the rock bands and everything else that have dumbed down the teaching of the Word of God, they're the, they were the first ones to start saying several years ago, let's re-examine the issue of homosexuality in the church. They began taking a soft stand on it. Then they turned to a neutral stand on it, and now it's an open acceptance. God says in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 11, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them, and the harp, and the vial, and the tabret, and the pipe, and wine are in their feasts. But they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Oh, they've got the harps and the vials and the tabrets and the drums and the guitars and the lights. And they also have wine, a false spirit. A spirit, and we're going to see this later on, not today, but there's actually more in the Bible relating to false prophets. False prophets won't tell you what's in the Bible. Remember what I said starting all this out. There's never been a false prophet ever who came and said, just read the Bible. Believe everything that's in the Bible. That's all you need to do is read the Word of God. Believe it. Trust in Jesus as your Savior, and He'll give you eternal life. No false prophet ever said that. They replaced the Word of God with prophecies out of their own heart, saying, God is like this. God says this, and God says I never said it. Read Ezekiel 13. And that's where we're eventually going throughout this series. Is that these prophets 
prophesy falsely because they will not say, thus saith the Lord from his word. Now they've got the music. And see, that's the thing. They took the real power of God, which is the Bible, out of the church, replacing it with the music, the show, the theatrics, the soft message, the easy way that God will make you healthy, God will make you wealthy, God will make you rich, God will improve this, everything will be okay in your life and you'll never have any problems. You could be like Joel Osteen. But the word of God is absent there. They do not consider the work of the Lord, neither regard the operation of his hands. The operation of his hands is that book that he's holding in his right hand, sealed with seven seals, which is this book. So, just because they're not rolling on the floor, barking like dogs, doing all those things that we saw, just because that's not there doesn't mean that they don't have a drunk spirit. Some people who are alcoholics, you would never know it. It's because they've learned how to fake it. And that's what a majority of these churches are, fake. Isaiah chapter 5. This is the evidence right here. Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil. That put darkness for light, and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes, and prudent in their own sight. Sounds like most preachers I know. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink. Which, notice this, here's the evidence now. It's not just the wild activity that we saw. It's their doctrine. They're full of themselves and full of what they say and what they think. There's a commercial out for Joel Osteen. You get this little device, you set it on your nightstand. It's got a little clock in it. And you hit a button and the words of Joel Osteen come flowing out every day. New words for you every day. For your love gift of like $39.95 or something like that. I'm just going, that is the most ridiculous thing. Who cares what Joel Osteen says? He's making a lot of money off this. And people are buying this. They're eating it up. But are they hearing from God? No. They're hearing from their new God, Joel. And it means that they have a drunk spirit. False doctrine. Woe to them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Stop right here. This is our righteousness, the word of God, Jesus Christ. And they take that away and they justify the wicked. They tell everybody, you're doing okay. God made you the way you are. It's okay. Live, live together. Couples living together, homosexuals living together, sodomites everywhere. They're justifying the wicked. Why? Because they're getting paid well to do it. See, that was what was in my mind years ago. If I dumb down the messages and I speak positive thoughts to everybody, then everybody will like me and more people will come and then I'll get a pay raise. That was my intention. I don't want to tell you about the beating I got from God over that. But that's the evidence that they have a drunk spirit there. Wine and strong drink. They justify the wicked and they take away our righteousness. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness and their blossom shall go up as dust. Because they have cast away, here it is, the law of the Lord of hosts, and despise the word of the Holy One of Israel. You see, it's very simple. When you take away this spirit, the other one just moves right in. Remember the teaching I did? I need to do this again on where dragons live. When you have the presence of the man, Jesus Christ, there, the dragons aren't there. They just don't like being around him. But take him away, they move right in. Micah chapter 2, verse 11. This 
is what most people have decided is going to be their spiritual leader, their guide, their spiritual mentor. If a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink, he shall even be the prophet of this people. Again, I'm making a plea to those of you in Kenya who are furious at me for daring to speak against the holy, God's mightiest prophet, Dr. David Awar. Are you so blind that you cannot see the clear blasphemy that comes out of his mouth? Are you so deaf to God's word that you cannot hear that what he's saying is a lie? You hate me. You despise me. And you cling to the false words of a man and not God. I will prophesy unto thee of wine and strong drink. He shall even be the prophet of this people. You've chosen the wrong prophet is what you've done. Whether it's Dr. O'War, Rodney Howard Brown, Kenneth Copeland, Joyce Myers, the Pope, Ellen White, Joseph Smith, Joel Osteen, Stephen Greer, Tom DeLonge. You've chosen the wrong prophet prophet. But really, two types of people in the world, those who are going to believe this book until the very end, and those who don't care and probably never did. God knows who you are. Proverbs 23, listen to God's warning and his Character analysis of people who follow false doctrine as strong drink. Proverbs 23. For a whore is a deep ditch, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. Anybody that's ever had an affair will tell you that. It's a trap. She also lieth in wait as for a prey. Remember, this is Mystery Babylon. And increaseth the transgressors among men. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Where's the word babbling come from? Babel, Babylon, babbling, all because no one understands their speech. So what's God going to do? He's going to send a nation whose tongue Nobody's going to understand. And it won't be the Russians. People know Russian. It won't be the Hungarians. It won't be the Czechoslovakians. It won't be the Chinese. Because people know Chinese. There's coming to this world a nation. And I've been studying that the last couple of days. That nation. Fierce countenance. Evil creatures coming to this world. Who speak the tongue of Babylon. Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. Stop right here. Now, I don't know my drinks very well. I don't know a Harvey Wallbanger from a martini. I don't know. But I know what mixed wine is. It's when a preacher mixes his own thoughts or somebody else's thoughts in with this book and makes them equal, like Joel Osteen. That's mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last, notice this, see the spiritual context here? It biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Stop. When the devil showed up to the Garden of Eden, did Eve change her mind? Yes. He spoke his poison words to her and it altered her. 
she now looks at that fruit, not as something forbidden, but as something deeply desired. You know, it's like Mick Jagger singing, I can't get no satisfaction. Oh, I'm sure he's tried, and he's tried, and he's tried. And as old as he is, he's never found it, and he never will. It's all right here. Thine eyes shall behold strange women. You know what that is in a spiritual context? Churches. Churches, women are churches in the Bible. You can have a pure church or a harlot church, strange church, false doctrine, any kind of false doctrine, doesn't matter what it is, false doctrine. Your eyes, you're going to see that big, nice building they just built, $10 million in debt now. They built this nice building, and you say, well, let's go there. That's a much nicer church to go to. They'll take our kids away so we don't have to make them behave during church like my parents raised me. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? And notice this. I will seek it yet again. If you've ever been hooked on any kind of drug, even prescription, or alcohol, or pornography, or anything. If you've ever been hooked on cigarettes or whatever, you've ever been hooked on anything, you know what it's like to try to lay it down and walk away, don't you? Your, your flesh lusts and craves after that stuff, and it's like, the devil throws everything in the way to get you to go back to it. It's in our nature. I will turn to it yet again. Doesn't matter the heartache, doesn't matter the consequences, doesn't matter the prison sentence, doesn't matter how much money it costs, you'll do anything to get it. Lots of people have been through that. God bless you those who have endured, put it down, walked away. Best thing you could have ever done. But see, God knows our nature, doesn't he? I will turn to it yet again. Isaiah 29, 9. Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken. Now he's going he's to explain it. This is it right here. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed. Imagine what we've been talking about. Which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, meaning the Catholic priest, he's very learned, I cannot, for it is sealed. It's a mystery, he says. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. You see, God is the one who poured out that spirit upon the people you know, the churches you've been to, all the people of the world, and God's going to pour it out yet again in his wrath and in his fury. And everybody in this world is going to drink of Babylon's cup. And they're going to get their reward of their wickedness. Again, if God has pulled you out and has kept you from falling back into those stupid sins, those stupid churches, those false doctrines, if God has kept you from that, get on your face before God and tell him thank you. Because, take a look on the screen. One of these is the devil. One of these is Jesus. If you're drunk or believe false doctrine, you will never know 
the difference between the real gospel and another gospel, the real Jesus or another Jesus, the real Spirit of God versus another spirit. See, Paul didn't tell us to watch out for Buddha or Mohammed. He's told us to be on the lookout for a different Jesus, one that is different than what you see in this book. And the first sign of it is not everything that God does is in the Bible. There's your first drunken clue right there. That madness is on its way. Don't fall for it. People, right now, more than ever before in the history of mankind, it is more important now that we know what this book says, that we study this book, meditate on this book, think on this book, examine this book, search this book, live by this book, believe this book, pray while you're reading this book, talk to God, let God talk to you, and hang on to it to the very end. Because some people you know, they're going to fall away. They're drinking now, you just don't know it. They're drinking false doctrines, false teachings, the internet. They're drinking that stuff in, spending hours watching YouTube videos and researching the New World Order, but not five minutes with God. God help us all spend more time in His Word. This is Pastor Mike. God bless you. I love you. You're the reason why we do what we do. Pray for the people of Kenya. Pray for our ministry as we reach around the world. Pray that God will continue to allow us to do what I believe he's called us to do as watchmen in these last days. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.